So we've talked about power in international relations. Now it's time to talk about morality. There's a lot of kinds of disagreements that people might have. People can disagree about facts, or they can disagree about values. If I say that country A has more tanks than country B, that's a question of fact. We can go count the tanks, and then we can both see whether country A in fact has more tanks than country B. But if I say that country A is a better place to live than country B, that's going to be a question of value. To settle that question, we're going to have to examine what makes a country a good place to live. And things like goodness or justice are not things that we can see about a country just by looking at them from a bird's eye view and then counting some aspects of them. Goodness and justice are evaluations. They're questions of value. Now, not all questions of value are questions of moral value. If I say that something or someone is beautiful, that's going to be a judgment of value, but it's not a moral judgment. It's an aesthetic one. If I say that someone is beautiful, I'm not saying they are better. I'm just saying that they're beautiful. Morality tracks our judgment about good and bad or right and wrong, and typically moral judgments are distinguished from other sorts of value judgments because they are prescriptive. Uh, pres prescriptive simply means that they give us uh, injunctions to do things or to not do things. They're action guiding in that sense. They prescribe behavior for us. Uh, they also tend to be universalizable. That is to say that they tend to apply to all who are in a relevantly similar situation. So if I say that uh, person A is beautiful, I'm not saying that everybody should find him or her beautiful. I'm I'm not making a universalizable judgment, I'm making a particular one. And finally, moral judgments tend to be overriding. Uh, what we mean by overriding here is that uh, prin moral principles tend to supersede our other principles. To say that they're moral means that they take precedence over our aesthetic judgments or our judgments of practicability and convenience. Right? Uh, morality is supposed to be uh, more important uh, to us than that. Now sometimes moral reasons can conflict so it's not going to be the case that every moral reason is overriding over everything else because of course moral reasonings moral reasons might conflict with one another. So for example uh, you know I promise to take someone out to dinner uh, you know on, a fr on Friday night but Friday comes around and uh, it turns out I'm a doctor and, uh, you know, a patient really needs my help. Uh, it's, you know, I'll have conflicting moral reasons. On the one hand, I have a reason that says that I should keep my promises. On the other, I have uh, a reason that says I should save lives. Uh, you know, in this particular case, it's probably going to be the case that uh, what you shouldn't do is keep your promise. You have moral reasons to keep your promise, but that's not what you should do, all things considered. You should probably go save a life, or at least that's how I would look at it. So moral principles are overriding, uh, and they tend to be overriding over non-moral principles, but within the area of morality, uh, there may be conflicts of reasons, and those need to be settled by yet other moral principles. We might call them meta-ethical principles, but we'll put that aside for now. Okay, so moral principles generally tend to fall into two categories. Well, there's many categories, but here's one way of cutting up the landscape a little bit. Um, moral theories can enter into our judgments uh, before the fact, so to speak. They can be action guiding, uh, or after the fact. They can be evaluative. Now, typically action guiding theories are theories that allocate praise and blame. They tell you how you should act, and if you fail to live up to the moral standard, then you can be blamed. And if you live up to the moral standard, or even go beyond it, then you can be praised. Right? Action guiding theories are theories about decisions that individuals make. But then there's also evaluative theories. Uh, these are theories that judge goodness and badness, and evaluative theories are usually theories about outcomes. They come after the fact. When all is said and done, you can look back right, and say that decision was a good one or a bad one, uh, and that can be different from whether it was praiseworthy or blameworthy. There are times when people, uh, when things end up, you know, 
going well, but you still think that the person was blameworthy for the way they acted. So an example might be that if you are out drinking with friends and you've had a few drinks too many and you decide to get in your car and you drive home and you get home, well, nothing bad happened. Uh, you got home, nobody got hurt, but on the other hand, we can still blame you for the decision that you made uh, to drive while under the influence. Um, and the opposite can be true too, right? We can, uh, bad things can happen without anybody really being to blame for it. Everybody behaved in a reasonable way uh, based on action guiding theories, but we can still evaluate. We don't have to say, oh, the outcome was good, right? Uh, so imagine that an earthquake hits China, right? Uh, the earth, nobody caused the earthquake. The earthquake was a natural phenomenon, but we can still say it was bad despite the fact that no one's to blame or praise for the earthquake. Okay. Um, this leads me to a slightly different sort of distinction, uh, or at least actually a related distinction uh, between consequentialism and deontology. Those of you who've taken uh, PolySci 3000, Foundations of Political Thought with me, uh, certainly have run into this distinction before, but there's a big fault line between those who think that what matters most is guiding people to make good decisions, so they start their moral theorizing with a theory of decision making, and those who think that what matters most is achieving good outcomes. They start their theorizing with the outcomes uh, and then work their way back to the decisions. Uh, consequentialists tend to start with accounts with, of what makes outcomes good. Uh, so, for instance, you might say uh, the outcome where most people are happier is the better outcome than an outcome where more people are less happy. So the right actions for consequentialism, that is to say good decisions, are decisions that bring about the most good. Whichever decision brings about the greatest amount of happiness is the right decision. Um, consequentialists can be associated with the sentence, the ends justify the means. Partisans of deontology, though, start with outcomes of right action. Good consequences don't matter that much if the actions that bring them about are immoral, right? You've probably heard the saying, the ends do not justify the means, and when someone says that, they're explicitly not being consequentialist. They're being deontological, right? So you treat people the right sort of way. That might not bring about the best sort of consequences uh, for you or everyone else, but you are accountable for at the end, what you can control, right? Remember, decision making is about what you can control and being praised and blamed for. Uh, you don't control the outcomes often of your decisions. Uh, you only control uh, the thought process and the motivations that you put into your decisions. So, partisans of deontolo deontology would prefer to start with an account of right action. Okay. Let's um, let's see how all of this kind of cashes out with respect to international relations. Uh, first, I want to say morality is, is almost always contextual. There are a few theorists like Kant who say that there are categorical imperatives, which means that no matter what, at all times and places, you should do X. But um, most people recognize that moral judgment is highly contextual. Um, lying to the police is wrong if the police are faithfully executing their duties and you are preventing them from doing so. So they're prosecuting a murder and you lie um, and you obstruct their investigation. I think most people would say that lying to the police is wrong under those circumstances. On the other hand, uh, if you have corrupt police officers that are, producing, that are um, pursuing their own private goals, uh, extorting money from you or, or some business, um, and abusing their power, it seems that lying to prevent them from doing that or to frustrate their goals in that context is not obviously wrong. Um, and it seems a lot less wrong, uh, and perhaps is not wrong at all. In fact, perhaps it's mandatory uh, to try and prevent uh, that from happening. And so uh, we can see that in different contexts, lying is good or bad. Uh, the global stage is a different context from the domestic stage. Uh, so potentially our moral principles will apply differently than we're used to, and we have to pay attention to that. We can't assume that what applies as a domestic context applies in the same way as on the international stage. We might have very similar principles, but they might cash out differently uh, in a different context. Okay, let me talk a minute about skepticism, because this is something that comes up quite a bit uh, in domestic politics, yes, but also in 
and especially in international affairs. Now, some people are skeptical that morality even applies to relations between states and people. You see this a little bit in how, in what pains uh, Walzer goes to to try and show that it's not true. But um, some people are just skeptical of all morality, full stop. Right? These are moral skeptics. Some people believe also that, or in addition, that morality is constructed within cultures, but that much less can be said about morality between different comprehensive value systems. So something might be true for us in this time and place, and something, something might be true for those other people in the same time and place, but uh, bridging that gap of value systems uh, is impossible, they'll say. There's no there's no way to do, there's no way to bridge uh, the value systems. Uh, other people say that morality, and especially justice, is a creation of states uh, by systems of law. And since there's no world state and no meaningful enforced international law, there is no morality between countries. I'm going to address each of these in turn. Let's talk about moral skepticism first. First of all, if you're a moral skeptic, this class is probably not for you. You're not going to enjoy it very much because we're going to be making a lot of moral judgments. Um, but more than that, it's just not the job of classes on the morality of, of coercion and state behavior to show that morality is real any more than it's the job of a class in physics to show that the world we live in is, in fact, actually real. Now, in both cases, I think, skepticism seems to fly in the face of our ordinary experience of the world. Um, we appear to experience the physical world, and we appear to experience moral judgment in a wide variety of situations. Uh, it seems pretty unavoidable that we experience the physical world, and it seems equally unavoidable uh, to make moral judgments. Um, I just want you to imagine for a minute what it would be like to live in a world where uh, that we're devoid of value, right? that we're devoid of, of moral judgment in particular. Right, you'd have a, a series of facts in front of you. Uh, you'd have uh, perhaps a, a Coke uh, or a Pepsi, like I have, sitting in front of me. Uh, you have a computer. You have a table. You have books. There are people in the rooms around. Uh, there are students walking around. Uh, these are all facts, right? To to think it, to 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 have a world without morality, without values. Would be that none of the would be to, to look at this world and say none of these facts are more important than one another, right? None of these facts, right? Because there's no value, right? So there's a Pepsi, there's a person, there's really no difference. I mean, we can describe them differently, they they behave differently, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, one is not better than the other, one is not more valuable than the other. These are all just things. These are all just facts, right? That's what it would be like to see the world entirely without moral value. And that just seems anathema to the human experience. We, we naturally and unavoidably make judgments. In fact, it doesn't even seem to be a psychological disability that um, removes value from the world. Extreme kinds of depression seems to seem to color our views of the world such that they, such that things acquire negative value, right? But it's still not going to be the case that everything is of equal value or equal disvalue. Okay. So it's certainly true that everything could be an illusion, right? That the external world is an illusion, that morality is an illusion, that our experiences are just, our everyday experiences are just incredibly deceitful. Um, or one could be true and, and the other couldn't be true. But I think the, the alternatives just don't seem particularly interesting, uh, don't seem particularly fruitful in terms of living uh, the kind of lives that, that we want to live. After all, will our lives seem better to us if we simply don't believe in external reality? Will it be better if we refuse to believe that some moral judgments are better than others? Will that be make uh, our lives easier? Um, it just doesn't seem like that would be true. Um, let me talk about cultural relativism. Now, there's a way in which cultural relativism is obviously true. Um, an example that's... Um, that I, I saw uh, written down by a philosopher named Patrick Grimm. He uses research on the Trobriand Islanders. It's a South Pacific island uh, that was uh, investigated by an anthropologist in the early part of the 20th century, Bronislav Malinowski. Um, and in the Trobriand Islanders, they had some interesting cultural practices. Uh, one of their cultural practices um, was derived of, of a, a belief that 
uh, when uh, a man and a woman reproduced, what was really going on was that the man was enabling an ancestor to enter the womb of the woman, and uh, that ancestor would then uh, would then eventually become uh, become a baby again. And um, uh, in this belief system, uh, what that meant was that the role of the biological father was not considered culturally very important. Uh, the biological father was basically the mother's boyfriend. Uh, the role of the father was taken on by the mother's brother, the maternal uncle of the child. And um, so it would be the case that, you know, the person who had very, very strong obligations towards the child in the Trobriand Islander culture is the maternal uncle. So the maternal uncle would be responsible for raising the child, would be responsible for educating the child, and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, the biological father of the child's responsibilities would be, uh, would be, you know, that of a, you know, of the mother's boyfriend. It would be, you know, presents at, at Easter and uh, at Christmas um, and things like that. So uh, you have a situation here where uh, the culture gives respons very different responsibilities in the Trobian Islands than they do in our Western cultures, for example. Um, and I don't think it's just the case that uh, people in the Trobian Islands think that the responsibilities of the maternal uncle are large and the responsibilities of the biological father are small. But I think it's probably the case that it is true that if you are in the Trobriand Islands and you do have, and you are the maternal uncle, uh, when your sister has a child, then you do have those responsibilities. And it's um, just like it's true in our culture that the maternal uncle is more of a Christmas and birthday presents kind of guy rather than having the strong obligations of the biological father, right? So uh, it just seems to be that it is true that one set of responsibilities pertains in one culture, and it is true that another set of responsibilities uh, is applicable in another culture, right? That's, that's where I think cultural relativism is at its strongest, right? It says that our responsibilities and duties are largely cultural constructs uh, in some respects. Um, but I think there's other kind of ways of specifying the idea of cultural relativism that are obviously false as well, right? There's a move typically that's made between descriptive relativism. So for instance, it is true that in some countries, most people are racists. Um, and the sort of idea that the sort of cultural relativism or non-judgmental cultural relativism uh, that says that it is true that in this particular culture, racism is true. Uh, and that seems a lot more difficult to justify, right? Even if it's in its most sophisticated versions, racism usually relies on very flimsy evidence of biological differences between people with different genetic backgrounds and uh, bad logic, typically judging individuals based on characteristics of the group, right? So, you know, all people of this race have this characteristic. That means that when I treat you as an individual, I'm going to treat you as if you have those characteristics. But of course, the average characteristic uh, may or may not apply in any given case, and so typically you have an ecological fallacy there. Um, okay, um, so that's not to say that that's, those are the only things that are wrong there, but those are things that are very obviously wrong with racist sorts of views, and it's just not going to be the case that I think we want to say that it just simply is true that one race is inferior to another in a particular culture. Um, okay. Um, but even let's say that culture were the only thing that mattered. Um, even if we accept that there's just these different cultures with incommensurate value systems that we can't really bridge the gap, one can't judge the other um, in any kind of meaningful, significant way. Um, it is nonetheless true that there are intercultural norms. There are norms that are developed through cultural contact, right? So states have developed norms in their interactions. And the culture of diplomacy, for instance, the culture of the United Nations, the culture of the European Union, uh, the culture 
um, of uh, international business, all of these are cultures that have been developed, norms that have been developed through intercultural contact that now constitute their own set of norms, right? So if that's the case, then even if culture is the only thing that matters, we can point to a culture, an international culture that has norms of its own, and we can judge uh, based on uh, those norms, right? We can judge people's behavior based on those norms. I think there's still reason to find that sort of um, account unsatisfying, but certainly if you're a cultural relativist, you have to be open to the possibility that new cultures and new norms are developing all the time. So if morality is a product of interactions and the culture that evolves through those interactions, then there is international morality. However, I think it's also possible to criticize that international morality, just like it's possible to morally criticize cultural practices, both from the inside and the outside. Because if we look at our own culture, it's not simply the case that we all accept the same values. There is a moral disagreement within given cultures. Um, but I think even without looking simply within the culture, I think it's also possible to criticize from the outside. Uh, so for instance, we might argue that given the purposes and values that states or individuals do share or do have, the norms that they've evolved and endorsed uh, get in the way more than they help, right? Again, they might be, uh, just like in the racism case, in the case of racism, uh, they might just be prey to bad facts and bad logic, and human beings are extraordinarily prey to um, bad evidence and bad logic. Um, now, that doesn't mean we we shouldn't be very, very careful about making these sort of sorts of claims from the outside. There might be important things about people's values uh, that we miss and legitimate things about their values that we don't understand uh, and uh, for which we would be unjustified in criticizing them. But I don't think there's anything to suggest that moral norms cannot be improved upon by criticism from the outside, but in light of the values of the people on the inside, so to speak. Let's talk about states and conventional morality for, an, uh, for a minute. This is the third kind of skepticism that we might run into. There's this family of views, uh, originating probably with English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, that argues that until a moral norm is enforced by the state, it's really just an opinion with no particular value except to those who hold it. So it's a kind of radical subjectivism about value, um, and the only way we get across that subjective divide, right, that abyss that separates my subjectivity from the subjectivity of other people, is when the state comes in and dictates a norm for all of us to follow. So what makes a moral norm true, and I put true in quotation marks, um, and worthy of respect is the fact that it serves a kind of coordinating function by facilitating orderly interaction, in particular by removing the bases for disagreements, right? Our subjectivity leads us to disagree about what's good and bad, right or wrong, but once the state enforces a particular norm, then we all know what's going to count for the purposes of interacting in this society within this jurisdiction. We're going to know what counts as right and wrong, just and unjust. So if enforcement through threats and sanctions is central to the creation of justice by the state, then the fact that there isn't a powerful world state, uh, the fact that the international arena is essentially an anarchic one, uh, prevents the topic of justice or morality from reaching much beyond the borders of individual states. Um, it just doesn't, once again, seem to apply. However, I think like with cultural relativism, this sort of view uh, seems to fly in the face with our ordinary experience of international um, of international conduct and the judgments that people often make about international conduct. Um, it just does seem to be the case that just like there are intercultural norms that there are international laws uh, that are observed with a reliable degree of certainty. I think it's a weakness in this Hobbesian view that it can't really account for the spread of norms between businesses and between states without central enforcement. Uh, it doesn't consider the possibility of order without design uh, and order without coercion. Uh, now, those order, those kinds of orders might be a little bit different, um, but to suggest that there is no order uh, without a central enforcer, uh, I think, is to fly in the face of, again, our experience of 
the international world where we see quite a few rules. We see a lot of regularity of conduct. We see a lot of law, um, both commercial and uh, treaty-based law. And uh, we see these laws having real effects in the world, even without a central enforcer. Now, so what is it that's enabling these rules to, to exist and, and have influence despite the lack of uh, an enforcer? Well, uh, one, the threat of being left out of important decision-making mechanisms, right? The fact that if you get left out of the UN, if you get left out of the WTO, if you get left out of a climate change conference, um, then you are not going to have a chance to influence what comes out of that conference, what comes out of that institution, uh, what can, comes out of those meetings, and as a result, uh, what might come out might be detrimental to your interests. So uh, you, you don't want to be left out. Um, you also don't want to be left out from important trading networks. The WTO I already mentioned, but uh, you want to, uh, you have an interest, an important interest in, in maintaining cooperative uh, relations with uh, other countries. You want your firms to be able to send, sell to foreign consumers, and you probably also want your consumers to be able to consume uh, products that can only be made abroad or that can only be made um, cheaply abroad. Uh, and finally, uh, there's this desire, there's a desire on, on the part of states and peoples to emulate successful practices, right? There's this desire that if a rule, if a rule works for country A, then country B is going to want to adopt it. Or if a rule works for the interactions between country A and B, then country C will want to also join that rule because it seems to be working for country A and country B. So you have a kind of uh, emulation through self-interest. Uh, that leads to the presence of, of binding and, uh, well, not bind, binding is too strong, but of rules that are, that seem to effectively regulate people's conduct, you know, most of the time. Just like laws effectively regulate conduct most of the time, so the presence of an enforcer is not a guarantee of security or order. The presence of an enforcer is just the presence of a threat. People still break the law despite the fact that there are consequences, and certainly people break international norms. Um, without the existence of consequences, but it's not clear that one is much, much more frequent than the other. Okay, uh, and this is a good time to introduce the difference between governance and rule, right? Countries in the international arena are not ruled by any superior entity, not even the United Nations, not even the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, in fact, one of the central norms of international society is the idea of national sovereignty, or state sovereignty, to be more specific about it. Um, but the fact that there is state sovereignty does not mean that the actions of states are not ungoverned, right? So the difference between being ruled and, and governance, right, is that you can be governed without there being a single central uh, authority doing the governing, right? You could have multiple overlapping networks of rules to which you are more or less a participant that can constrain your behavior and regularize your behavior such that it just looks like you are following norms and you are in fact following norms. So to the extent that states gain from gain benefits from belonging to international organizations and having frameworks for peacefully settling and heading off disputes, uh, as well as living in a more predictable environment, uh, then even powerful states will often submit to rules of international conduct, not without exception, uh, but often will find it much better to submit to those rules uh, than strike out on their own. So we have some competing frameworks for understanding and evaluating the morality of international relations. Um, lots of ways to understand the morality of inter international and interstate behavior. Two lessons I think stand out for me. Uh, you can take the lessons you want, of course, but I think we shouldn't be too quick to apply our domestic moral standards to the international arena. Remember, morality is contextual, and so we're going to have to, even if we keep the same principles, the way we apply them in a different context uh, might be different in novel and surprising ways. And second, we, pro we shouldn't, like many people, have done, throw up our hands in the air and just deny the scope for any moral judgments in this context, saying the realm of states is just completely permissive, right? Uh, there is no right and wrong. It's anarchy, and we just have to do the best we can. Um, I think evaluating the actions of states and international actors is very consistent with our human experience of international behavior. We don't just look at a country invading another like we look at an earthquake 
or an accident of, of fate, right, or an act of God. We, there's very particular people that we can blame, there's decisions that we can review, uh, and denying ourselves the tools to blame countries for things like genocide or praise countries for admitting refugees, I think, again, would be dramatically at odds with our ordinary moral practice.